Good morning, and welcome to AWS Summit Berlin 2022. It's great to be on stage again, so thank you for coming. I hope you had a great morning after your great travel to here. And uh, my name is Konstantin Gonzalez. I am a principal solutions architect with Amazon Web Services out of the Munich office. And uh, today we're going to talk about the topic of lock-in. So I joined AWS in 2012, and throughout the last nine years, I've been working with many, many customers, maybe hundreds, I haven't counted them. And I've worked with startups, small to medium companies, large multinational companies. And at some point in time in our conversations, most of the time, the topic of lock-in comes up. Customers might say, wait a minute, I don't want to get too locked into your technology or to a specific vendor or to a specific way of doing things. I want to retain my freedom. So I took all of the learnings of those years and put them together into some material that should help you understand the topic of lock-in better. Let's start with a simple definition, and I simply copy-paste this from uh, Wikipedia here, but any other definition is probably valid as well. Vendor lock-in makes a customer dependent on a vendor for products and services, unable to use another vendor without substantial switching costs. Now, there are three elements that are key here. The first one is dependencies. Dependencies may be necessary to get something done, but they may also get in the way of changing, which brings us to the second important piece here, which is choice. Choice is always a good thing. And at AWS, we do everything to give customers a lot of choice. So choice is something important to retain when thinking about building your next big thing in the cloud. And the third important component is actually cost. The good news is it all just boils down to cost. It's not like you're never allowed or never able to switch. It comes down into understanding the costs of switching and minimizing them. So when you think about lock-in, try to think of it in terms of dependencies, the kind of choices that you want to retain, and the cost of making those choices. Vendor lock-in or lock-in in general comes in different flavors. And um, I have to thank Gregor here for his book, Cloud Strategy. Great book. Go buy it. Um, where he categorized different flavors of lock-in. And the first flavor is vendor lock-in. This is probably the most classic form of lock-in. And it simply describes the difficulty to go from one vendor to another vendor for any particular solution. Could be mobile phones, could be emailing systems, could be cloud providers. There's also product lock-in. And you might say, well, this is the same. Well, it's, it may be not the same. So product lock-in means difficulty to go from one product to another product. And these products might be from the same vendor, or they even might be vendorless products, like open source. So if you ever try to migrate from an open source database system to another different open source database system, that's where vendor lock-in might come into play. There's also version uh, lock-in. So if anybody of you had some experience with um, upgrading to a higher version, again, this could be more of a challenge, and it can lead to some lock-in here. There's architecture lock-in as well, because if you ever try to fundamentally change the architecture of a system, then it comes with some barriers, right? It, you need to overcome some lock-in-like barriers when, say, shifting from monolith to microservices or shifting back or whatever. There's skills lock-in. You might have all of the technology, vendor, whatever, sorted out. But then it comes down to the skills in your employee base, the skills how, how much do you understand the technologies that are involved in switching from one technology to the other? And there, are, there may be legal lock-ins too, right? Like uh, exclusive contracts or licensing contracts or even compliance things. And finally, there is mental lock-in. In the last years, I've seen this all over the place. You might find good solutions to all of these other topics, but if your employees and if your builders still think, oh, we never did it that way. Mm, that may come at some this. There might be some fear of the unfamiliar involved. That's another kind of lock-in that I see happening all over the place. Now, the good news is lock-in never means real lock-in in the sense of you can't change. You can always change. It all comes down to the cost of change. So understanding the cost of change is the key to understanding 
how locked in you are or how not locked in you are. So when switching vendors, it is mostly a cost of how much does it cost to switch from one vendor to the other in terms of extra licenses or migration costs, whatever. Same with product costs. If you want to migrate from one database version to the other database, uh, database system, um, again, there's a migration cost associated, but after spending that migration cost, you're done migrating and you had a successful chain. Again, same thing with version updates. With architecture changes, you need to pay for re-architecting something um, in terms of uh, people power or, some, or even hiring consultants or whatever. But again, it all comes down to the cost of change. Skill changes might include um, training costs uh, into the picture. Um, even the legal side might include some extra licensing efforts. So it really comes to change. Even the mental part is can be overcome by investing into a good transformation program or into a good change management program at your company. So the good news is there is no real lock-in in the sense of it's impossible. The real story here is around what do I need to do and how much does it cost to switch into a better world, into a better technology or a better environment. There are two key costs that are very, very let's say, insidious and, and uh, non-obvious, but can be real blockers to change. And the first one is opportunity cost. I've seen many customers doing a lot of things that weren't really related to their own business. They started building their own abstraction layers. They started building their own systems, their own cloud platforms, whatever. And, um, and eventually, the key question to answer here is, is this really part of my core competency? Should I invent a new database system as an automotive provider? Maybe, maybe not. Try to understand that part. And try to understand what else should your people rather do. Is this part of my core competency as a company to be investing so much time and effort into base technology that is easily available everywhere? And the second very, very insidious part of cost is actually sunk cost. What does sunk cost mean? Well, we already paid so much for this technology. Can't we reuse it somehow, right? And there, there can, this can really be a mental blocker to adopting new technologies. I've worked with companies who wanted to go all in on cloud, and they were fully committed to do, OK, next year we're going to be all in in the cloud, very, very flexible. This will go, is going to help our business a lot. But they had still this last data center hanging somewhere. And the, 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 the people started asking, OK, we have this database data center here. Can we just reuse it? Here's a new project. Should we do it in our own data center? Or should we move it into cloud? Lots of discussions, lots of time wasted, even though the general direction was cloud first. This is because sunk cost can be, um, can be a detraction of your uh, mental processes when building new systems. So the key question here to ask is, what are the past costs that are blocking you still. And then maybe the, 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 the solution here is to simply ask, OK, if you were to start from scratch right now and you had nothing, how would you solve that problem? And how would that solution be different? And then use that as a guiding light versus using history as something that is blocking you. So today, when we talk about um, lock-in, our goals are really to bring down the cost of switching, making switching as easy as possible. And at the same time, when we look at the benefits, what are we going to get out of those switching costs? How can we maximize the benefits we get from switching? Because after all, if you want to change something, you'll probably want to get some benefits out of that. So how can we maximize those benefits? So if we do that, then we can make switching easy, and then we gain the freedom, the freedom to choose whatever technology is great for our project, and we get the freedom to move to a better technology and maybe to move back. If we find out that the new thing isn't as good as after all we want to, to go back, that's fine. What we really want here is flexibility. We want the freedom to move back and forth. We want the freedom to choose whatever technology is great for our task. So here are some common tactics. This, these are things I've seen many, many times with customers happening. Customers who try to avoid lock-in 
they end up paying a, an extra price for that, ironically, right? So some customers say, OK, OK, I like you as a provider, but I'm only going to use exchangeable technologies. For instance, some customers say, I just want to use virtual machines because everything else would be proprietary. Or uh, I'm just using containers, just Kubernetes, nothing else. And uh, that's going to be my ticket into lock-in heaven. The downside here is you're missing out on a lot of benefits. So customers are using clouds exactly because cloud providers have solved so many problems for them that they can focus on their business. And if you're limiting the, the choice and all of the services that cloud providers offer to just a handful of services because they're exchangeable, you're missing out on all of them. At AWS, we have more than 200 different services with a lot of value that you can leverage right away at the press of a button, at the call of an API. If customers say, I'm only going to use the exchangeable ones, you're missing out on a lot of benefits. Similarly, some customers standardize. They say, OK, I'm going to use this abstraction layer in the middle. It could be any of those um, open source or even not open source platforms that provide some kind of abstraction of cloud providers behind the scenes. So standardizing on a single abstraction layer comes with some downsides too, because this is a different form of lock-in. Instead of locking you into a specific cloud provider, you're now locked in to that specific abstraction layer. And that abstraction layer, well, who gets to run this abstraction layer? It could be your internal IT. It could be a service provider. So you're not really solving the problem of lock-in into a specific cloud. You're replacing one lock-in with a different lock-in. And that can come with its own set of problems. Some customers avoid contracts at all costs. I don't want to be locked in on the licensing side. And that's a, it, it's a good thing. However, you're also miss, missing out on opportunities to save money. And um, most of the time, the motivation to avoid lock-in is actually to save money. I don't want to be in a scenario where the provider will raise their prices, and then I'm, I'm here and I have to pay them, right? So ironically, avoiding contracts, you can miss out on a lot of money-saving opportunities through reserved instances, savings plans, e enterprise discount plans, that sort of thing. So in these cases, it may um, make sense to understand the scope of those licensing costs. Am I going to, to um, do a contract for one year or for five years? So one-year contract is probably better in these cases. And finally, I've seen some customers building everything from scratch. These were like the golden times where my, most customers told me, I have my own private cloud. Go away. Well, building everything from scratch at a current level of standards is a lot of work. And if you are not happening to be in the cloud provider business, it is a lot of work that can dis detract you, distract you from what your company should be really doing. So the downside here, it's very expensive, it is time consuming, and it's also risky. Because now you have to think about all of the security implications, all of the high availability things, all of the problems that cloud providers have solved already. So a bit, an interesting model that is behind this whole thinking here is think about the value chain in IT, which starts all the way down from sand, silicon, chips, hardware, data centers running that hardware, services like infrastructure, platform, software as a service, maybe serverless too, and then IT architecture on top of that, and finally, the actual use case that you want to solve through IT. Because at the end of the day, we want to get some value. We want to support the business, right? And in this value chain, we know that AWS is right there in the middle. We start with building our own chips, and we build everything up to the level of architecture. And you can pick any of these things and use them from cloud providers like AWS. Now, the key thing to understand is you as a company, and this is a different for, very, for different companies, you as a company, where is your place here? Where is the place where you can add value to the value chain by saying, I'm going to build my own X? Are you going to build your own chips? Maybe as a chip company, it makes sense, right? Are you going to build your own servers? Again, as a cloud service provider, we do our own servers because we can create a lot of value by designing our own servers. But maybe as a, let's say, as a banking customer, it might not make sense to build your own servers, right? Are you going to build your own cloud services, infrastructure, platform, whatever services? Again, is this really your core competency? So where is it where you can add the most value into this IT landscape here? That's an important thing to understand for your own business. So 
what I would like to propose here is try to think about it and do a thorough but rational analysis. And it starts with analyzing use cases you want to run in the cloud independently from other. And the reason is simply there is no one size fits all. There is no one strategy you can do for all of your applications. Try to understand use cases independently from each other. And when you, under, when you analyze those use cases, understand the unique value you're getting from technologies, vendors, approaches, architecture, whatever. Try to understand the value you're getting, and then try to analyze what is the switching cost. How much does it cost to go from vendor A to vendor B, technology A to technology B, or whatever? And another important factor here is the likelihood of switching. Am I just analyzing stuff too much, and the likelihood that I will really need to switch is going to be very close to zero? So why, do, why go into that big rat hole of analyzing stuff if the likelihood of switching is very, very low? But on the other hand, if it's very likely that I will need to switch in a year, then it's worth the, doing a thorough analysis here. And finally, a great cure against lock-in is to develop a strong switching competency. The better you can switch, the easier it is for you as a company to switch or as a development team, the less lock-in becomes a, an issue because then you can sw simply switch away instead of feeling locked in. So let's take a closer look on the cost-benefit analysis of switching. And the great way to analyze this is to compare the switching cost, how much does it cost to switch, against the unique utility. What is the unique value I'm getting from a specific technology provider, whatever? And unique value means, what is the value that I'm getting from this specific technology that other technologies don't provide? Right? That's the uniqueness here, right? So we can place four quadrants here. If you get low unique utility, lots of comparability, and low switching costs, you're in commodity terrain, right? This is your basic run-of-the-mill x86 server that everybody provides. No big differentiation here. No uniqueness between vendor A, vendor B. And low switching costs, you just reinstall and you're done, right? So that's what commodity is. Sometimes you might run into a really good x86 vendor that gives you a really great servers, and it's still easy to switch away from them. And that's fine. And that is maybe an ideal case, right? But it is also a rare case, because usually, um, great differentiation comes at some price, right? Now, when you don't see a lot of extra value coming from a specific vendor, but the switching cost is high, that's where you need to be careful. And there is a, a different case here. Sometimes you get great value, but the switching cost is high, but you're willing to endure the high switching cost. You're willing to, to go into an accepted lock-in, and that might be an acceptable solution as well, right? So let's analyze a little bit those use cases. If the switching costs are low, there typically is no problem at all. No need to worry about here, right? These are typically applications that run on naked virtual machines. This could be SAP, Microsoft apps. Just, just to be clear here, I'm talking about the infrastructure, not the software, right? So you might be um, locked in into a specific application software, but the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure, this is easy to switch because you simply reinstall on a different um, server hardware or something, right? So typical applications like SAP, Microsoft, Java-based apps, open source apps, they're easy to switch from one cloud provider to the other, from one server hardware to the other. Um, no big deal here. Of course, on the software side, there may be uh, issues, right? If you're looking at something that runs on a virtual machine, like Java, these are all the scripting languages. Again, scripting languages, PHP, Ruby, Node.js, you name it, they're easy to switch from one provider to the other. Again, no big issue here. And finally, container-based apps. All providers offer some way of running containers, so it's easy to switch if you're just running inside a container. Let's take a closer look at the accepted lock-in. I have an accepted lock-in, and that's this one here, right? I am married to my wife. We have a wonderful relationship. I love my, wi my, lo my wife. And, uh, and therefore, I'm willing to accept a kind of lock-in, which is called wedding, right? So that's fine. So lock-in cannot be evil all the time. If you are seeing a very high amount of unique utility and you're getting a great value from your provider or your technology, then it is acceptable to also accept some kind of lock-in and that makes switching harder. But then again, you're getting great value for your money, right? So this can be a very beneficial scenario. 
And um, in these cases, you should not see your technology partner as a supplier, right? Instead, they are really partners. They are partners that are sharing your goals and that are really giving you the right benefits for your money and the right benefits for the amount of lock-in that you have so that you can worry on other things like your own business. So in these cases, try to maximize the value you're getting out of that technology vendor, whatever. Try to get as much as possible out of the relationship, and then you'll be fine. But be careful. Keep an eye open. A lot of today's vendor lock-in relationships started as partnerships and over time degraded for some reason. So keep an eye open, understand when the value is going down, and then try to look out for options. Now let's take a look at the careful quadrant here. So you might find a lot of, or some number of, of cases where you're really not getting a lot of unique value out of a specific solution. What do you do about this? So these could be legacy proprietary databases, for instance, or some kind of legacy other old vendors that are not really helpful anymore. So there are two things you can do here. The first one is you can ask, how can we reduce switching costs, right? So switching costs are high today. What are the ways you can reduce that switching cost? Maybe you can run a bigger consolidation program or a bigger migration program, not just for a single app, but for all of the apps of the same category. And then you can aggregate the switching costs and then get some economies of scale out of that, or better yet, get some discounts from whoever is helping you with that migration by aggregation and therefore bringing down the switching costs so that switching becomes something that is, yes, it's painful, but it's one time painful for a bigger scope and that helps you uh, leverage some efficiencies here. Or maybe the other way around. Can you get more value out of that technology? Maybe you're not just leveraging enough value out of that legacy technology, and you might be able to increase the value side and turn this into a more acceptable scenario for you. So as a result, the majority of cases turn out to be OK. Either they are accepted lock-ins because you do get a lot of value, or they are just cases of low switching costs, and then you just switch and, and you're done with it. So try to focus on the careful quadrant here and try to find good answers here. Now, the other thing you can analyze is how likely is that switching to happen? Maybe you're overanalyzing things and um, it's not going to be needed. There's not going to be any switching needed. So the likelihood of switching is, again, important. Again, the lower quadrants are easy. If the likelihood is low and the switching cost is low, there is really no problem. If the likelihood of switching is high, but the switching costs are really low, this is what agility really means. I worked with a customer who, and I'm oversimplifying here, but I, I worked with a customer with a strong development team, and they were switching message brokers on a monthly basis. Today, it was Amazon Kinesis. Tomorrow, it was um, Kafka. And then it was back to Kinesis. And then, oh, let's try hosted Kafka. And then, oh, maybe well, let's do a mixture of everything. That's fine. It's great if you can do that. It means that your engineering or development team is really flexible, and there is not, not a big deal in switching. And that gives you agility, because now you can switch to whatever solution is best for your needs. Now, if the likelihood is low, but the switching cost can be very high, that's a bit of a gamble. How sure are you that, this, that the likelihood is really going to stay low, right? So try to understand these scenarios a little better. And if you know that you need to switch in a year or so, and the costs of switching are high, then you need to be really careful, because now you're, you're seeing things coming, and you need to react to that scenario. So when looking at these top cases here, for, the, for these cases, it's important to run a thorough risk analysis, right? How long will that vendor last that is giving service to you? So this is applicable to legacy technologies. How long are you still going to get supported by that vendor? Maybe you are stuck with some old version of an operating system that doesn't receive any security updates anymore and increases the, the likelihood and the need to switch. So need to understand that part. Are you going to run out of support? Will the costs go up over time? So this is where you need to place the biggest attention here. And the other thing is, if you are planning for a technology that might need to switch soon, because you're not quite sure whether that technology is, is ready yet or whatever, 
try to limit the scope of the new technology, try to, to invest in some kind of insurance. We're going to use this technology, it's very promising, but the switching costs may be high, and we don't know whether we need to switch. So let's first use it on this specific project only, see if it holds, and then we can expand as necessary or switch back with a manageable cost here. There is a technique called facades that I'm going to explain in a, in a minute. Um, so if you're not sure, you can build facades. You can abstract away just a single technology instead of abstracting away the full thing, right? So try to factor the switching costs in advance into your project budget so that you do have the money ready or the resources ready when it's time to switch. Okay, this is where customers typically start talking about multi-cloud, right? Multi-cloud is the solution, right? So what is multi-cloud? Well, the reality is many customers are using multiple clouds already, right? And there are many reasons for that. For instance, they might be using different clouds with different use cases, or they might be using different clouds because they bought this company and then they bought this other company, and then they ended up uh, having multiple cloud providers because they came with the company that they acquired, right? Or maybe it's vendor driven. They got a lot of credits from a specific vendor and then somebody in the purchasing department said, hey, we have a lot of credits sitting here. Why don't we just use them? And then you end up having another cloud provider. Or maybe because it's cool and shiny. Hey, I found this new unicorn cloud. Let's just use it because it's cool, right? It has unicorns. I like unicorns. So lots of reasons why customers go multi-cloud, right? Just be aware of why. Because multi-cloud comes in flavors too. So again, here's a page from uh, Gregor's book. Um, here's how you see different scenarios play out over multiple clouds. Um, so try to be aware about, OK, what clouds are we using here and why? What is the history? And how much of it is intentional? And I think it's important to understand why. And after you understand the why and the utility, then you can move on to doing a real plan and executing on that real plan. So, is multi-cloud really the solution against lock-in? Well, there are a couple of, of pros here, right? So using multiple clouds gives you more choice. Choice is a good thing, so why not? And it gives you a bigger variety of vendors, meaning that if you are talking to different vendors, your purchasing department has a better negotiation position, and that can help you negotiate better contacts. That's the classic thing that happens all the time. So these are the, 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 the good things that customers see in, in, uh, when they look at the multi-cloud scenario. But, and there's always a but, right? Here's a quote from Gregor. Excessive complexity is nature's punishment for organizations that are unable to make decisions. So sometimes organizations don't want to decide and they just end up having multi-cloud because it's the easy decision, it's the easy way out, right? And what does it mean? Well, if you are using multiple cloud providers at the same time, you add complexity into your picture. And the extra complexity means you need to think about management twice or three times. You need to understand compliance for multiple cloud providers, security for multiple cloud providers, networking for multiple cloud providers, governance for multiple cloud providers. And that adds up to the overhead and administrative cost of doing IT. It also means that you probably need to introduce some additional abstractions. You want to have uh, one single pane of glass monitoring across all of them. You need to abstract away something. Or maybe you really want to do the thing where I'm going to develop an application and it doesn't matter which cloud I'm deploying on, so you need to abstract here. Again, this adds to the complexity of the solution. And sometimes customers end up in a lowest common denominator scenario, like we discussed in the beginning. Yeah, you can use three different clouds, but only stick to virtual machines or containers. Don't use all the other shiny services because they are not comparable, right? So, it's, it's not always unicorns, it's not always happy times. Try to understand the benefits and the risks and also the downsides of multi-cloud. So whether you use one cloud provider or many, try to come up with a good plan. Try to be deliberate and rational about it and understand the landscape. This means develop your cloud competencies. You can't use multiple clouds without understanding clouds. Try to be competent about using cloud services. Make access to cloud as easy and reliable. If you do decide to use one or more clouds, make it as easy as possible for your employees to get the benefit out of them. Offer choice to your business departments. After all, 
Using multiple technologies means increasing the amount of choice, and that choice should be accessible to your business and to your developers so that they can actually leverage that choice. And then try to use a use case analysis. Is this use case better on this platform or on this other platform? Try to find a use case by use case best answer to what, how you want to put this into the cloud. And again, complexity is the real enemy here. Try to minimize complexity. Try to come up with simple solutions that help you stay flexible. All right, so we did our analysis. We have a good understanding about the landscape. How do we learn how to switch fast and easy? How do we get into that agile state that really can help us be free from lock-in? There are three key things you can do. The first thing is reduce the blast radius of dependencies. What does it mean? So for instance, when you go from monoliths to microservices, this is something that many customers are doing. You get a lot of flexibility, because instead of having to switch and migrate this large, big monster of an application, which is a big multi-year effort, you get to cut it down into smaller services, into smaller components. It doesn't have to be all the way micro. It could be like modular components. And then you can migrate those components one by one. Uh, there is this uh, fig, fig tree pattern um, that uh, can help you cut down monoliths into smaller services, and you migrate them one by one. It becomes much more manageable, much more easier, and uh, much more agile in the process. Strangler tree, sorry. It's the strangler fig pattern. Sometimes I mix up my biology here. Um, this allows you to switch faster, because you're now switching in smaller granularities. And it also allows you to find the right tool for the job, meaning that instead of putting everything into one single large honking database that has to do everything, you can now choose smaller database bases of different types that are better suited to individual things. Some things run better on an SQL database. Other things run better on a key value store. Yet other things are probably best kept into a graph database. So instead of putting everything into one monolithic everything database, you can now choose smaller granularities of databases. And again, they're easier to switch one by one versus switching everything. Now, the second thing you can do is simply to become smarter by developing the ability to switch as a discipline. Teach your development and, and engineering teams how to switch and how to switch easily. So that means prioritizing learning and training. At Amazon, we have this leadership principle we, ca we call learn and be curious. And that customer who was switching message queues all the time, they were just curious. Let's try this other thing here. Oh, cool. Now we know the downside. So let's try going up back again. So by prioritizing learning and training in your tech teams, you help them develop the competency to switch easier. Try to experiment frequently and then adopt what works. This is the benefit of having an experimental culture. It helps you discover the right technologies, and the ability to switch is a precursor to the ability to experiment. So if your management asks you to, hey, let's do some experiments, do more the experiment, experiment thing like the startups do, that's where the switching competency becomes really handy. So accept continuous change. The times are over when we ran an analysis and then we did the same thing for five years. This doesn't work anymore. Instead of doing this big project and then five years business as usual before you think about any changes here, try to work in change on a weekly basis or at least on a monthly basis and accept a world where change is constant. If the last years have taught us anything, it's that change can come around the corner very, very quickly. So you might as well prepare for times of constant change. Let's go back to the facade thing. So when, when customers think, I'm going to build this large abstraction layer that abstracts away all the clouds for me, it's really um, a, a baby bathwater situation. You shouldn't throw away the baby with all of the bathwater, right? Try to be very deliberate and specific about the kind of abstractions you want to do. And facades are one way to do that. So what are facades? They're mini abstractions. And that's something that programmers do naturally. Here is this new shiny service. It comes with 20 features. I only need three of those features. So as a programmer, I'll write a small wrapper class. That wrapper class will help me deal with these features easier. So I just, just need to use my wrapper class, and the wrapper class talks to the new service. 
That's what a mini abstraction layer does. That's what a facade does. So you can use facades to your advantage. It makes programming easier because it makes dealing with any new cloud service easier for you. And if you want to switch to a different cloud service, all you need to do is rewrite that small abstraction class, that small wrapper class, which is easy. It can be done in an afternoon or two. And then you can switch to a different service. So using uh, facades is a great strategy to developing more agility in your architecture. So facades are easy to implement. It makes it easy to switch. And you only need them to use them where really necessary. So this limits the scope of work that you need to do abstraction layers. You don't have to do that big abstraction layer for everything. You can focus this kind of work where necessary. And if you want to go one step further, try to learn about hexagonal architecture. There are lots of talks out there, papers out there, books around hexagonal architecture. What does hexagonal architecture mean? It means to, you place your company-specific domain logic or business logic in the middle, like, for instance, in a container or in, into a library. And then you develop ports and adapters around that. And if you want to switch to a different platform, all you need to do is change those adapters, but the inner part stays the same. And that makes it very flexible. You can use this pattern to attach different databases, different message queues, different other services to your core logic. And it also helps you advance the feature set of your application very quickly. You start with developing a small API layer on top of that. And then you can add support for message queues. And then you can add support for a front end, and again and again. So that makes it very easy to, to build an evolutionary style to your architecture. Alistair Copern is the one who developed this concept. Um, try to look up some talks there. It's really good. So everything we discussed today is completely independent of AWS. You can apply this to technologies. You can apply this to programming languages, to vendors, whatever. It's very neutral. But after all, I'm paid by AWS. So let me give you a little bit of an AWS view here. So first of all, at AWS, we focus on making switching easy. We are not interested in locking you in. So all of the AWS services are strictly pay-per-use. There are no upfront costs. And if you want, if you choose to have a discount plan, we make them as flexible as possible, like savings plans, right? Of course, we come up with great migration tools because we want to help customers adopt AWS. But those migration tools, they work both ways. If you don't like AWS, you can use the same migration tools to migrate away from AWS. Migration tools are not specific to just AWS. You can use a database migration service to migrate from any database to any database, and it doesn't matter to the service where those databases are running. The APIs for AWS services are well documented. Most of them are simple. Not all of them are simple, but they are portable. They are RESTful web services that are well understood, and they have open data formats like JSON. So I still remember the old times, and I have some gray hairs from that, where something as seemingly simple as a text document format was a gigantic labyrinth of very hidden code that made it super difficult to translate from one text format to the other. That was, those were really painful times, but the times are over. So let me show you a simple example here. Here is a piece of code written in Python. And all this code does is it uses the Amazon Recognition Service to analyze this picture. And now the Amazon Recognition Service will tell you what's on that picture, and it will give you a JSON that tells you what probability for which animal is on that picture. The blue pieces of that code, this is, this is what is AWS proprietary and specific. And you can see that it's not really hard to port, right? Of course, I'm oversimplifying here. But the key point here is the times are over when code was very cryptic. And now it's easier. All right. Focus on switching easy. And um, we give you lots of choice. And we really work hard to making price reductions easy for you. So we're, we've reduced prices 111 times since 2006. So the reason is we want customers to stay with AWS because they want to, not because they must. So it's time for me to come to the end. Become a competent switcher. Make switching easy and a natural thing for you. Yes, some logins can be beneficial, and then you shouldn't worry too much about them. 
Abstraction layers can be logins too, so be aware of that. Analyze your use cases individually. Don't try to come up with a blanket solution for all, right? If you build a strong team with good architecture, then you can be immune to switching. And we try to make switching as easy as possible. If you're failing on, on that, please let us know. So with that, thank you very much. I put together some papers and blog posts on this page, so please take a photo. Um, don't know whether we can make the slides available, but um, try, try to make a photo of this slide here so you can read up on that topic. With that, thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, we have a microphone here. And uh, thanks for coming, and enjoy the rest of the summit.